Oil was discovered in 1968 in our backyard. And that's when the native claim settlement fight started. It was almost like we were set up to fail. But we didn't. The polar bears are in abundance here on the shore because their habitat has gone away because climate change is happening. We're the ones that are sitting in the front row. After watching what had happened on the reservation system down in the lower 48, Alaska Natives agreed to a different system. Now, it's not a perfect system. We always like to represent ourselves, but they represent us, but they don't live here. To put a product into the atmosphere that's harmful to the animals and people, is this compatible with your traditional beliefs? We're being asked to keep the oil in the ground, to save the world. Katwavik is one of eight Inupiat villages on the North Slope. <laughs> oh, it's a close-knit community. It takes a lot of people working together to make sure that we uh, have a successful whaling season and successful harvests. We catch caribou, moose, fish, seals, ducks, and geese. It was only 59 years ago that Alaska was ratified as a state in the United States of America. Many people involved did not consider much what the original owners of the land already had and wanted to keep. May God continue to bless the Inupiat people. May God continue to bless this land. May God continue to bless the sea from which cometh all of our abundance. And the church said, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation is a company that's tied to the land claims that we were able to achieve in the early days. So let's go into our boardroom. We have our table here, which is made around the uh, traditional skin boat that we use for whaling. And it, it's a symbol of the principles that we've taken from whaling as far as the importance of working together to achieve more for your people. The Inupiat people uh, lived all across the Arctic Slope region of the state of Alaska, fairly nomadic, uh, following the migration of the animals. But the whale was the center of our culture. And I've seen older folks when they start dancing and start singing because the whale was caught. There's so much joy of catching such a great animal. You had Yankee whaling uh, introduced into our waters from about 1850 till right around 1910. As we got into contact, of course, disease uh, killed off a lot of our native people. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, it was traumatic. We need to get over it. We need to learn from it, grow out of it, and be able to succeed. Oil was discovered in 1968 in our backyard, Prudhoe Bay, the biggest oil discovery in North America. Basically, that was where my mom grew up. You go there now, it's a whole oil industry complex. Who gave them the permission to start taking our land for the oilies? And that's when the native claim settlement fight started. The federal government had to settle the land claims. We didn't want it to be a welfare bill. We had to remind Congress we're proud people that are self-sustaining, self-reliant, and that 
we want to keep it that way. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act is a grand experiment where after watching what had happened on the reservation system down in the lower 48, Alaska Natives agreed to take some cash and also to take ownership of land. Our portion was five million acres of land uh, to be selected and uh, 22 million dollars to start our businesses. Trying to select those lands while we were being left out of the most highly potential areas. That was the challenge. It was almost like we were set up to fail. But we didn't. I guess there was some concern, wondering what a few savage Eskimos would do with millions of dollars, right? From the early days of right around 94, we were able to grow the company to about 225 million in revenue. Today, we're close to 3 billion in revenue. We own two of the refineries here in Alaska. We're into construction, government contracting. Uh, lately, we've been uh, expanding into the lower 48 in order for us to grow. A shareholder base of about 13,000, which is the Inupiat people of the Arctic Slope and their descendants. Our shareholders received probably about 5,000 a year. We didn't have running water, we didn't have the clinics, the fire stations, uh, the schools. Responsible development, maximizing the benefits to our communities and our people had to be in place. It's one of the big finds in the world, oil and gas. And as soon as I heard that, I said, you know, I love the Zanwar. This is big stuff. I love it. So it's great. The vast majority of Alaskans have supported responsible, safe development in the 1002 area. There's a number of communities that are implicated, most important of which is Koktovik. I was charged by the Kotovik Inupiaq Corporation to take charge of lobbying for the opening of the coastal plain of our National Wildlife Refuge. But we do have a number of folks who are opposed to it. Two years ago, city did a poll, um, and we were pretty much split in half. You'll have people that hate your guts because you're saying no. Growing up, I wanted it, and then when I get to my age, I'm against it. The main concern is the animals, where they live. When you're walking, just keep an extra eye out, make sure there's no bears around. We do have a relationship with the polar bear in that we share this special place with them. We get a lot of refuge visitors for polar bear viewing, and the numbers have been increasing every year. I'm guiding to see polar bears, and I realize the polar bears are in abundance here on the shore because their habitat has gone away because the world has been burning too much fossil fuel. It's uh, climate change is happening. Well, this time of year, they should be out on the ice eating seals. That ice is not there for them. I've seen them eating young caribou on the beach. They're going to have to learn to adapt, I guess. We have to learn to adapt, too. We've got to change. We have to change. The climate is changing, and it's probably changing quicker in Alaska, and we're feeling the effects more sharply than people in other areas of the world. We're seeing uh, earlier thaws, and we're seeing later freeze-ups. The ocean was always frozen. The ice was always there. It's just not there anymore. Why is our land being eroded away? Because there's no ice to stop the impact of the huge storms that come crashing into our land. Big chunk size of this building sometimes will have ground just break off. Krill 
that the whales feed out of start from the bottom of the ice. If there's no ice, will there be krill to feed the whales? Having it rain during the middle of the winter season, the caribou can't get through the ice to get to their food. Folks were piling caribou carcasses by the hundreds. I'm waiting for palm trees to grow. That it's all man-made is questionable. I don't know if uh, any of the scientists have taken into account the celestial relation of the Earth to the sun. Oh, I've heard everything. I've heard the sun is burning hotter. Uh, I believe it is man-made. All the major scientists uh, are of the mind that it is man-made. We're reminded by our elders that the same principles that we use in whaling, you apply that same principle in everything that you do, working together, whether it's business, government, our culture. These pieces of baleen on the higher wall here represents the eight communities throughout the Arctic Slope. We formed what we call the Voice of the Arctic Inupiat. It basically takes all the leadership from all the organizations across the slope to go in one voice. ASRC tries to present that they are the voice of the people, but they are not. It is a for-profit corporation that is in joint venture with the oil industry at this moment. On the western side, they all want development. They want it here in our land. And if, they, if it was flip-flop, they would be against it because they want to preserve their own hunting grounds. We always like to represent ourselves, but they represent us, but they don't live here. That system is a good system that has worked reasonably well. Now, it's not a perfect system, and there's, there's differences of opinion among shareholders and community members. The corporation concept separated all the tribes from their traditional governments and lands. The lands were taken away and put it into for-profit corporations. And so therefore you have what appears to be native interests advocating for these developments. A lot of native people don't believe in what the corporations are doing, but the corporations are mandated by law to make money with the resource. All the oil companies, they say they need to drill in just this little area. But then while they're doing that, they'll say, oh, we need a permit for this one over here. We need a permit for that one over here. They're going to spider web all over and look for that oil. And if they find it, they're going to extract it. We as Inupiat people considered ourselves the first conservationist, but with the right balance. We believe it can be done in a way that it doesn't harm the migration of the caribou. It's not as if we're perfect, but we have a really, really strong track record. Shell came in here. My question was always, if there's an earthquake, what is your earthquake plan? The lady laughed at me. Then right after they had that meeting, you had that big oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. The whole community watched it. If they did that out here, we'd be screwed up, screwed real bad. Over the years, we've taken a stance against offshore because of the unknowns. The possibility of a, a oil blowout in icy waters where it could do a lot of damage, uh, both to the environment and the animals that migrate through. So it's our position that if offshore development was going to inevitably happen, that we be at the table of decision, that we have an opportunity to invest, while at the same time making sure that it's done safely. What are they going to do if they have an oil spill? Be oil everywhere. Our fish, whales, seals. We won't be able to get our food.
there is no doubt there's risk and there is no doubt there will be mistakes. I can't imagine what a big catastrophic spill would do on the North Slope. It would impact communities for decades. Who's going to benefit? Is there other oil available that's more easily accessible? And should, should we look into alternative clean energy? Life is a lot easier nowadays than it was before any of the development occurred. We have some folks still alive who have gone through starvation. They do not want to see that ever occur again in our communities. These gravel roads, the power lines, the houses that are built, pretty much every infrastructure that you see here has come from taxing the oil industry. We're being asked to keep the oil in the ground, in our backyard, sacrifice our economic opportunity to save the world. Never mind uh, what it takes to run the schools, the power plants, the basic infrastructure that we need. Ultimately, it's probably the investors that, uh, that look at it and say, can we make money on it or can we make more money doing uh, clean energy? The environmentalists have tried to use local people to split us apart. The folks that are against development, the locals around here call them tree huggers and stuff. The people who they call tree huggers, I include myself in that. We have a care for the environment. You could ask local native politicians, is this compatible with your traditional beliefs to put a product into the atmosphere that's harmful to the animals and people? We live here and we have to deal with these issues that uh, come before us. We're stuck in the middle of two sides, oil and gas development and environmental protection.